This episode is sponsored by InVideo. How hard can it be to safely land on the moon? After all, it's not like we haven't done it before. Since 2013, there have been at least nine attempts at a soft landing on the moon. China, India, Japan, Israel, as well as the US and Russia. That's if you don't include the ones which failed before they got to the moon. But only 4 or 55% have landed successfully, and of those, three of them were Chinese. It's almost as if we've forgotten how to do the things that we spent the equivalent of hundreds of billions of dollars and over 10 years perfecting. But after Apollo, the moon lost its appeal, and we switched our interests for almost 50 years. But now the moon is back, and big time. The last people to walk on the moon was the crew of Apollo 17, who left on the 19th of December 1972, which is almost 52 years ago. But we didn't stand still. Here's just a tiny selection of what we did after the moon. NASA repurposed the remains of the Apollo program, mostly the Saturn Vs, and created America's first manned space station, Skylab, in 1973. In 1977, the Voyager probes were sent off to the outer planets, and now they are at the edge of the solar system or in interstellar space and still going. The space shuttle was launched in 1981 and lasted until 2011, and in 1990, the Hubble Space Telescope was put into orbit by the space shuttle, which transformed our view of space and allowed us to see further back in time we have ever done before to the very early universe. The International Space Station became operational in 2000 and has been occupied ever since. We have sent robotic probes to every planet in the solar system and successfully landed 10 uncrewed landers and rovers on Mars. We've even landed on a comet, returned samples from an asteroid, and flown through the sun's lower corona. We now have rocket boosters that are bigger and twice as powerful as the Saturn V, and will soon be able to return and land by themselves, so they can be used many times, dramatically cutting the cost of getting into space. Science and technology has come on in huge leaps and bounds, and yet getting a spacecraft to land safely on the moon still seems to be one of the most challenging tasks. So why is this? Now, the new lander programs will use AI to make them fully autonomous, so they can make their own decisions depending upon the situation they find themselves in. And something else which has piqued my interest is the new generation of AI video makers. InVideo are the sponsors of this episode and have created a fully AI-driven online video creation app called InVideo AI. All you need to do to make a fully featured YouTube, Instagram, or TikTok video or short is to give it a detailed prompt and it will go off and make the video complete with background music, human sounding voiceover, script, and stock footage. Here's one I did, a tongue in cheek short about how far space travel has come. And the prompt I used is this. Create a YouTube short about how far we have come when it comes to space travel. Make it cheeky and use an authoritative British male voiceover. Then choose the audience, the look and feel of a video, and the platform, and that's it. Click generate and wait for the results. In a few minutes, I had a complete video. Ah, space. The final frontier. Though, not so final anymore, eh? Our ancestors gazed at the stars, dreaming of what lay beyond. Now we can say, been there, done that, seen the film, got the t-shirt, and ate the breakfast. Now, the more detailed the prompt, the better the end result will be. However, if you don't like it, just regenerate until it makes something you do like. If, however, you're still not satisfied with the result, you can edit anything by using their unique and most powerful editing tool, the Edit Command Box. You can even clone your own voice and use that to add personal touch to your videos. Get started with InVideo AI for free, and you can create up to four videos, but with a watermark. If you want quality videos without any watermarks, which I highly recommend, upgrade to a paid plan which starts as low as $20 per month, which is a lot cheaper than Adobe Premiere Pro, and it also gives you access to millions of royalty-free stock footage clips, images, and a very good human-sounding voiceover. Give it a try, and I think you'll be impressed with the results. Just click on the link in the description below to try it out. Well, looking back at the original space race between the US and the Soviets can give us a few clues. 
This was an international race between two superpowers with differing ideologies and was as much about the projection of these ideologies through their achievements in space as national pride. And as such, each one spent a huge amount of time, money and resources on their respective programs. The Apollo program cost about 2.5% of US GDP per year for a 10-year period in the 1960s. In total terms, it was over $300 billion in 2024 money. Back then, everything that was being done was new and had not been done before, and was certainly not an easy ride. We knew almost nothing about the surface of the moon, and it was thought by more than a few scientists at NASA that the lunar dust could be so deep and soft that a lander could just sink into it or keel over so much that it would not be able to take off and return back to Earth. So before any manned Apollo missions, NASA had to find out what it was like on the surface, and the only way to do that was to send robotic landers to analyse the regolith or lunar soil and see if it was possible to soft land on the moon. The first ones weren't so much landers as impactors. This was the Ranger program of 1959, a planned series of nine missions. Each one was to crash into the surface of a moon at varying places and take TV images on the way down that would be beamed back to Earth up until impact. Of the nine attempts, the first six failed, usually because the rocket either blew up on a launch pad or shortly after, and on the sixth one, the camera failed as it approached the moon. 118, holding steady. No video. Roger. No video. Roger. Still no video. Roger. The Rangers soon gained the nickname of the Shoot and Hope program. Only the last three missions worked as planned and the program cost the equivalent of $1.21 billion in today's money. This was followed by the Surveyor missions, seven of which were sent from June 66 to January 68. Although the preparation of these missions had been ongoing since 1960. In fact, both programs had been the headline missions for the US to match or exceed the Soviet lunar orbiters and landers, which had beaten the US to the moon, up until Kennedy announced the Apollo program in May 1961. This was a big gamble for the US to take, to do something that was way out of everybody's comfort zone and something that they knew would be very difficult for the Soviets to compete against, both from a technological and an economic standpoint, and certainly in the eight-year time frame that Kennedy had given for the US to put the men on the moon and safely return them by the end of the decade. This relegated the Ranger and Surveyor programs to be the support acts, now gathering data on how manned missions could be done. Five of the seven landed safely on the moon to complete their missions, and all of them are still there. These were the first NASA spacecraft to soft land on the moon, and were just four months after the Soviet Luna 9, which was the first spacecraft to land safely on the lunar surface. In 1969, Apollo 12 landed close by to Surveyor 3, and astronaut Pete Conrad removed the camera and brought it back to Earth so it could be studied to see how the unfiltered sun's UV and particle radiation had affected it over its two and a half years on the moon. These missions were the testing ground to prove the technology that would later be used on the Apollo landers included the most critical space engineering challenges of the time namely the descent guidance and control system, steerable throttleable engines, and radar systems required for determining the lander's altitude and velocity. There was just no way to fully test these flights here on Earth and simulate the landing on the moon with its thermal and radiation environment and deceleration with no atmospheric resistance from 2.6 kilometers per second relative to the moon before firing retro rockets to a soft landing about 3 minutes 10 seconds later at 3 meters per second. The cost of the surveyor missions was 469 million, which in today's money is about 4.4 billion. Now, many might think that we don't need to prove that we can land on the moon and we can just copy what we did last time, but there is a problem. The technology of today is very different from that of the 1960s, 
Just look at a car made in the 60s and one made today. They both do the same job, look pretty similar, have four wheels and drive along a road, but under the skin they are very different. With even a modest new car being filled with microcomputers and electronics controlling everything from the touch activated door handles to the anti-lock braking systems and everything else in between. These would have been unrecognisable to a 1960s mechanic and the same thing has happened to spacecraft. Virtually everything has changed. Even the type of engines being used are not the same as the Apollo lunar landers. Then they used a hypergolic fuel, a fuel and oxidise which ignites on contact with each other. Ideal for the depths of space and in the lunar surface, but they are very dangerous to handle and toxic and you can't make them from the basic materials that you would find on the moon. The new landers will use cryogenic fuels such as liquid methane, hydrogen and oxygen. The latter can be made from water ice which we believe is available in large quantities in the permanently shady craters of the moon's poles. However, these will have to be started with an ignition source like a spark and have to be 100% reliable. If the engines don't start on the descent to the surface of the moon, then it will be a short one-way journey. The new moon landers will use LIDAR which uses lasers instead of microwaves and radar to produce much narrower beams which have far fewer issues with scattering and returning of false echoes over a wide area. The landing will be also controlled by computer and use cameras and AI to look for the best landing spot to avoid boulders and craters and all of this needs to be tested in the harsh lunar environment. All of these things will need to be human rated as well before they can be used for manned missions. It's effectively like starting all over again, although we still retain the general knowledge from the Apollo missions, and this is why it's taking so long and also not going to plan sometimes. NASA is also doing things differently this time, and instead of building things in-house, they are subcontracting often small companies to build experimental landers on what would be considered a shoestring budget. The intuitive machines Nova C, the mission which took place on the 22nd of February 2024 with the IM-1 lunar lander cost $118 million and was part of the Artemis program under the NASA Commercial Lunar Payload Services or CLIPS program which will use small, cheap missions to test and prove critical technology. If some fail, it won't be a game stopper and at least it won't have cost too much money. The Nova C mission will be a follow on from the 2010 NASA project Morpheus to build a vertical takeoff and vertical landing vehicle with a non-toxic spacecraft propellant system using methane and oxygen and autonomous landing and hazard detection technology. The IM-1 lander named Odysseus was the first US made lander to return to the moon in over 50 years and was the first spacecraft to use Methalox, a methane oxygen engine to navigate between the Earth and landing on the Moon. The IM-1 was also to use LIDAR to detect the distance from the surface and the velocity, though this was made inoperable by the safety override which should have been removed before the flight being left on. However, the payload also included a NASA built LIDAR, which was there for testing purposes, which when it was discovered that the main LIDAR wasn't working, was software patched from Earth to work with the navigation system. The rough landing was caused by the lander coming in slightly faster than expected and when it landed one of the support legs broke causing it to fall over on an upward slope of a small crater which it landed in. It ended up leaning over at a 30 degree angle with one of the solar panels facing the ground which limited the power production and the main antenna pointing away from vertical which reduced the signal strength back to earth. Now this could have been seen as a failure, but it is part of the move fast and break things methodology and still proved a lot of the technology used, even under the extreme circumstances. It was also a very low cost mission at 118 million compared to the Artemis 1 mission, which was about 4.2 billion to fly around the moon and return the empty crew capsule back to earth. For the NASA Artemis mission, there will be two more missions as part of the Intuitive Machines Nova Sea project. These will deploy the Trident ice drill to sample ice from below the lunar surface and the Micro Nova Hopper, which will work as a standalone hopper lander 
to hop into difficult to reach places such as deep craters on the lunar surface, as well as other new instruments and sensors. When it comes to the actual Artemis manned flights, NASA will choose between SpaceX and Blue Origin landers closer to the time after each has been tested on the moon. So in answer to the question, why is it so difficult to land on the moon? It's because we've simply left it too long and we now have to start all over again to catch up on the 50 year gap. If we had continued with the moon missions after Apollo, the changes would have been more gradual as new tech became available and we would have had bases on the moon and probably on Mars by now. And all of this would have been something that would have been easy to afford if we didn't spend the vast sums of money in perfecting ways and how to kill each other. But that's a whole nother story for another day. So thanks for watching and a big thank you goes to our patrons for their ongoing support.